In this video, we are going to be looking at the Burp extension WebSocket Turbo Intruder, which is a great modern extension for testing WebSockets directly within Burp. It's built using Burp's new Montoya API, and it was developed by Port Swigger's own Hannah, uh, apparently, as it appears in her GitHub repo, which you can find on GitHub right here, which I'll link, of course, in the video description. Under releases, you'll find the jar file, which you can conveniently download and uh, add into Burp. And of course, I've done that already, as you can see here under my extensions tab. So let's now go and look at the extension. If I go over to repeater, you'll see that I have a message already captured, a WebSocket message already captured. This is, of course, the same WebSocket echo server that I've been looking at in my other videos. It's very simple. I send it a message. It sends me a message back. That's it. I change my message. It sends me that message back, right? So if I right click in here and I go to extensions, WebSocket Turbo Intruder, send to WebSocket Turbo Intruder, we can get started with WebSocket Turbo Intruder, which opens in a new window, just like regular uh, standard old school HTTP intruder. So let's extend this window a little bit and we'll look at the different uh, components that are going on because obviously it looks a little bit different than standard Turbo Intruder. At the bottom, we have our familiar uh, script window here, which allows us to code in Python. The top left, we have our payload or default kind of baseline WebSocket message. So this is just the testing one that I had within repeater. And in the top right, we have our handshake or upgrade HTTP request in order to initiate the connection. And this is obviously very helpful because it lets us modify the uh, this HTTP request to modify the nature of that connection if we're dealing with a WebSocket system that let's say it's, it's processing cookies or other parameters on this upgrade request. Well, now you can build automated attacks that take that into consideration and you can potentially manage multiple different connections with different properties that you um, initiate on that upgrade request. And we'll look at those examples because in this video, what we're gonna do is go through a few of these examples. And then in another video, I'm gonna make uh, a really short example just showing you how to code up something custom. So uh, let's start with the basic example here. It shows you the, uh, the kind of skeleton structure of what your uh, scripts should look like for WebSocket Turbo Intruder. At the very top, we have Q WebSockets, which is taking in two parameters, our upgrade request, which is this, of course, and our payload, which is this, of course. And then we want to create a connection. So we use WebSocket connection dot create, passing the upgrade request and that's going to create a connection for us. So we use that connection object now to queue payloads. And in this very simple basic example, all we're doing for payloads is taking, you know, payload, remember that's just this default message. So we're just taking that and for I in range 10, so, you know, for, for 10 times, we're just adding that to the queue. So we're sending this message 10 times. It's no more complicated than that. Now, one thing that you're gonna note that is a bit of a difference in, in the paradigm between uh, WebSocket Turbo Intruder and <laughs> a standard Turbo Intruder is the fact that we have these two different handlers. Um, with HTTP, you send a request and you get a response, right? So if you're handling responses, there are requests that are associated with that. You don't have to do anything extra. It's the, it's just a set of, of pairs, right? Request, response, request, response. And so when requests come in, you know the corresponding, or sorry, when responses come in, you, you set your handling logic on that response and then you know the corresponding request to associate it with. With WebSocket messages, you know, we're sending messages out and we're getting messages back and there's not necessarily that correlation between a single message out and a single message in. So you may want different logic to handle how you're building your results table that consists of all of those messages. And so the default logic here is just very simple. You know, for, uh, web, for messages that go out, we add them to the results table for messages that come in, we add them to the results table. So let's just fire off this attack and see what happens in this very simple case. So I click attack and look at that super fast. One of the advantages of WebSockets, of course, right? So just with Turbo Intruder or really any other automated attack, we have our results table, which has some key information for us. The message ID, of course, is the order in which these were added to the table. We also, crucially with WebSockets, have the direction, right? Is this a message to the server or is it a message from the server to us? 
The length, of course, is important. So we have uh, the length of the payloads. You'll see that only one stands out as different because, <coughs> excuse me, this was the one message that our server sends to us when we initiate a connection. We have the time. And then we also have a comment column here, which um, you can actually add comments to in your Python code if you want to. You can associate comments with specific messages out or in, but we're not going to do too much of that. Um, so looking at this table, you might notice um, one potential issue or, or, or one thing that you might not like when parsing through um, the uh, the data here. You know, with the, with the server that we're testing, again, even though WebSockets are very flexible, our target server behaves very similarly to HTTP in that we send it a message and it echoes uh, a message to it. It sends us essentially a response to our message. And yet the way that the results have been built here is it dumps all of our messages that we sent presumably in quick succession to the server. And then the server eventually sent all of those messages back, including the you know successful connection message. And then we've handled all of those and added those to the, the results table. But um, really, you know, the, a lot of these messages that are coming back are, are effectively associated with a specific message going out. So one thing that we might want to do is click on the halt here to halt our uh, attack, not that we're still attacking, but it lets us then click on configure. But we might want to go back and configure this such that there is a delay that allows the results to be added to the results table uh, in a, an order that makes sense to us in terms of how that server actually behaves. So there's actually a default example already ready for us called the sleep example. And it's very simple. We're importing the time library and then we're sleeping for a couple of seconds um, at the point where we're queuing up requests to send. And if I click attack now, you'll see that the behavior is very different. Of course, there's, you know, quite a big delay, but we have now, um, you know, we, we are sending a first <laughs> initial message there that that um, that sneaks by before the, uh, the message back from the server. But, you know, now roughly we have our messages, our messages in corresponding to our messages out, right? So, we send a message out, we get a message that comes back. And that might make a lot more sense when we're actually parsing the results and looking through which messages from the server correspond to which messages that we, we've sent out. Uh, again, as with any WebSocket system, this is all going, like how you set this up is all going to depend on how it's designed, how it behaves. And um, you're really gonna have to make sure that you understand how that application is developed. And, and how it's handling communications in order to determine, you know, what uh, handling of messages makes sense to give you the results in an intuitive and really an actionable way that's going to let you uh, identify, you know, and, and correlate the things that you did, you know, the payloads that you've sent in the behavior of that application. And unfortunately, I can't tell you, I can't give you a single rule to account for all of those possibilities, but I can show you around the functionality of WebSocket Turbo Intruder. So, Let's just look at a few more examples and then we'll wrap up this video. So, and by a few more, I mean, we'll look at all the rest of the examples because why not? We might as well go through them all. So the next one, just going back up the list is recursive, which shows you another thing that you can do here, which is kind of interesting. And you can do this in regular Turbo and Shooter here uh, as well. So here uh, under our uh, handle incoming message, we have a, um, we have our WebSocket message coming in and we can get the connection from it, which is interesting, right? So we're getting the connection object from the message that's coming in and then we're queuing up uh, another payload, right? So if we look at this, it's going to look uh, quite different. Uh, we're sending our initial payloads, we're getting, and actually I'm gonna need to halt this because it's going to keep going because it's an echo server. Um, you know, we have our initial payloads, then we get a bunch of messages back uh, and then those messages that we get back, for every message that we get back, we send a new message um, with the payload foo in there. And then as a result, the server sends us those back. And then as a result, we queue up 10 more and so on, right? This attack would go on forever because of how this, this server behaves. Uh, but there may be a situation in where you, the messages that are coming back, you might want to uh, handle that information and create new payloads based on the information that you're receiving from those messages. So that's what recursive lets you do. Um, I haven't had uh, a use case for this in testing WebSocket systems just yet, but maybe such a case will arise, right? It all depends on what developers are doing with WebSocket applications. 
Um, one direction I think is very simple. Simple. It's just not logging outgoing messages. So if I click attack, um, it just shows us the messages from the server to the client. There just simply is a return instead of adding results to the table. Um, the Web Security Academy lab example, I'm actually going to skip this one because I haven't done this lab, so I don't know what it's doing, but uh, you might want to check out. If you haven't looked at Portswigger's Web Academy, I would definitely encourage you to do so and check out that lab and see if this is useful. Uh, maybe it just solves the uh, solves the challenge for you. So remember we talked about comments, so you'll see the basic example with comments um, shows off the comment capabilities. Uh, it's very simple here. Um, the queue a method takes an additional parameter uh, that I guess acts as uh, a comment for that payload uh, for that specific message in the queue. And additionally, there's also a set comment uh, method on incoming, well, on, on message objects. So on our WebSocket message, under incoming messages, every, every message that we receive, we're adding the comment bar. And so it looks very simple. Payloads going out, say foo, and messages coming back, say bar. Uh, that's obviously not a very useful example, but it shows you how that functionality works, right? And you might want to, like, if there's very complex WebSocket messages coming in, for example, uh, you know, I've seen very large WebSocket messages, you might want to implement some logic that parses them and extracts certain values so you can very quickly look at the results of an attack. So that might be a good use case for using those comments rather than having to dig through the full messages. Um, we talked about, uh, or I mentioned multiple connections. So this is a situation where actually, if we look at the basic example, you'll note that, you know, we're just creating one connection because maybe that's all we need. And probably that's what you'll need in most cases. From my experience with WebSockets, uh, I haven't come across many different use cases for uh, maintaining multiple different connections during an attack of this nature. Uh, but if you go to the multiple connections template example, you can create multiple different connections. And in this case, there's a simple connection or there's a simple example where we create two connections using the same upgrade request. And then on one, we queue our default payload. And on the other, we are just queuing you know, the word foo. And then we also have the multiple connections, different upgrade requests example, which shows us a case where you know, we're actually modifying the upgrade request in order to create two distinct connections, right? So one connection that is you know, maybe unauthenticated versus a connection that is authenticated. Uh, and then adding a couple of uh, of payloads to to each of those. Um, so those are all the examples. And honestly, it's uh, it's a great tool for this because by exposing a Python interface, uh, it's giving you a lot of flexibility in the way that you're uh, developing and, and tailoring your attacks. I've seen a few quirks um, with the tool, potential bugs that uh, like you might see erroneous uh, messages from previous attacks. Um, it's something that uh, I'm going to try to debug and maybe create um, an, an issue for if I encounter that again. Um, but uh, otherwise, it, it's uh, been a great tool so far that I've used in actual testing. And in an, in our next video, what I'm going to do is take one of these uh, examples, probably take the basic example and show you how I would work with this to create uh, an attack that is more tailored to um, uh, a, a more realistic example rather than just sending the same message 10 times. So I hope you found that uh, useful and interesting and stay tuned for more WebSockets Turbo Intruder.